you guys are too nice. You might want to hold the applause till we see if I do any good. Um, I just want to start off by saying thanks for being here. I'm excited to be here. I'm a little nervous. It's I don't think I've ever spoken at this conference before and hybrid and all those things, a lot of moving parts. But uh, this is a really fun presentation to give. Uh, just briefly, we're going to start off talking a little bit about ther physical therapy, mostly about exercise. And then we're going to transition into adaptive sports, which is really one of my big passions in life. Um, so, oh, that's the click I was wondering about. Let's see if I problem. Oh, problem solved it. Okay. Um, so I just want to start off by talking a little bit about me. Uh, I work for the University of Utah and the University of Utah does a lot of stuff. Uh, under the umbrella of the University of Utah, I work for a program called the Utah Program of Inherited Neuromuscular Disorders. That's a mouthful to say. So we call it UPIN for short. And UPIN is a multidisciplinary care team and a translational research team. So it's probably a pretty similar structure to a lot of the healthcare teams you work with in your local state. Um, under the umbrella of UPenn, I work as a physical therapist and I spend time in both clinical care uh, and multidisciplinary clinics. So when you come on for your six month or annual follow-up um, and you see the doc and then they say, oh, we're gonna have PT come in. In Utah, I'm one of those PTs. And then also as a clinical evaluator on multiple clinical trials for individuals with neuromuscular disorders. So from there, we're going to transition into talking about exercise. And I really wanted to start this off by kind of giving a resource. Uh, this is a guide written by Kate Eichinger and Tina Duong. And a shout out to them. It is an incredibly good guide that my, the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation helped uh, publish and get out there. This is a QR code to it. I recommend scanning it, downloading the PDF. Um, I really, I read this through this to prepare for this talk uh, and I learned some things. So I always learn something from Tina and Kate. So it's nice to be able to have that as a resource. And a lot of what we talk about with exercise is gonna be somewhat of a sum summary of what they brought up. So from there, why exercise? Um, so one thing we know about myotonic dystrophy, we know a lot, but one thing we know is that individuals with myotonic dystrophy experience progressive decrease in muscle strength. And we know that decrease in muscle strength results in a loss of function and it can make uh, daily tasks and engaging in exercise more difficult. Um, we also know that inactivity and aging also result in a muscle loss of muscle strength. Um, and exercise is really essential to counteracting uh, decreases in uh, muscle strength and function due to inactivity. So when I'm talking with patients in clinic, one of the things I always say as kind of my tagline is we want any weakness you have to be solely from your myotonic dystrophy, right? We don't want it to be from an inactive lifestyle. So the next question we always kind of think about is, is exercise safe? And this is a snapshot of a couple research studies. There are far more out there. Um, the talk this morning on exercise and myotonic dystrophy uh, had even more research coming out that was really uh, interesting and helpful. But overall, um, studies show that moderate intensity exercise is safe and uh, may benefit individuals with myotonic dystrophy. We can see here a couple that I've bulleted, uh, 12 weeks of aerobic training was found to be safe and improve fitness in individuals with myotonic dystrophy. Uh, the next one down is talking about strength training and moderate intensity strength training um, appears to do no harm, so appears to be safe. And then strengthening exercises in combination with aerobic exercise is likely to be effective. Uh, and then I kind of put at the bottom here, and I wanted to just briefly talk a little bit about, these are somewhat vague statements, right? This is really good research. These are published articles, but the statements we're getting from them are somewhat vague. And why are they vague? And really what we think about is 12 weeks. Okay, that, that was that study. That's when we're thinking about myotonic dystrophy, we're thinking about years, right? And generations. And so what we see that is in a 12 week period, we're, we're, we see some improvement. We see that it doesn't do harm, but what does that mean for an individual who engages in routine physical activity over five years, over 10 years, right? We know there's some progression to myotonic dystrophy. Does exercise modify that trajectory 
over five years. And we just don't have studies showing that, right? So we have to make some jump to saying, well, if we see this at 12 weeks, it's likely to benefit us over the hard long term, because it is incredibly hard to design an exercise trial that's going to go over an individual's one year, five years, 10 years, right? And with advancements in like electronic medical records and so forth, we're getting more of an ability to do that and ask those questions. But that's kind of where the research is at now. And so that's why sometimes these statements feel a little vague. There's still things we don't know. And we're still limited by the way we can ask these questions under a standardized research protocol. So from there, I just want to kind of briefly talk about types of exercise. And again, a lot of this information, basically all of this inf information is explained in greater detail in that handout I highlighted uh, at the start. So stretching, we don't often think of that as a form of exercise, but it is. Um, it's designed to increase flexibility and extensibility of muscles and tendons. Um, there's different types of stretching. So it can be active, it can be passive, and it can be active assisted. Passive is when someone moves it for you, right? So if you're hanging out and I come up and I move your wrist into extension, that's a passive stretch, you can stretch the muscles on the other side of the joint. Active is when you're doing it right? So you're taking your muscles and you're moving through that range of motion. Um, active assisted is a combination thereof, right? So you're doing a little bit of work, but you also have a little bit of external force to help. I think a good mental image a lot of people have of this is, you know, the pulleys that you like hang on a door and you can kind of like go back and forth with, that would be an active assisted uh, stretching. Uh, why do we recommend it? So we know it decreases muscle tightness um, and that can help reduce muscle imbalances. So if you're really strong on one muscle group is really strong and one muscle group has some weakness, if there's muscle, if there's tightness in that muscle group, that's really strong, it can overpower the other one, right? One way to think about that. And a good example in myotonic dystrophy is, uh, in your ankle dorsiflexors, which bring your toes up, right? We know that those muscles can get weak. And even if the calf, the muscles in the back that point your toes has some weakness as well, oftentimes it's still a lot stronger than the muscle in front. So if that's muscles tight and you already have some weakness in the front to bring up your toes, it's the muscle to bring up your toes and move into that ankle dorsiflexion, not only has to overcome gravity, also has to overcome some of that tightness in your calf. And so if we stretch that calf, we get that muscle a little bit looser, that can help, right? And then some of the recommendations are two to three times a week for about a minute. Um, you can do it all at once. You can do it you know, two 30 second holds, finding what works for you, right? <clears throat> and then next we talk about cardiovascular um, or aerobic based exercise. So that is any exercise that's designed to get your heart rate up um, or your and your breathing rate up. And one thing before I forget is I kind of want to highlight here is that when we talk about types of exercise, we often kind of like silo them, right? We say, I'm doing it right now. I'm guilty of it right now. I'm saying stretching. I'm saying aerobic, big shock. Next, I'm going to talk about strengthening. And I talk about them in silos, but really they all kind of mesh together, right? If you're going for a walk and you're bending your ankle, you're putting a stretch through your calf with every step you take, right? If you're doing a cardiovascular based exercise that gets your heart rate up, there's some level of strengthening that's going on there as well. And then if you're doing a primarily strengthening based exercise, but your heart rate increases, you're also getting some cardiovascular. So remember that these things cross over and interplay with each other. So, uh, after that little bit of a soapbox, I was on, uh, types of cardiovascular exercise, uh, cycling, walking, jogging, um, housework. And then we were just talking a little bit earlier, um, water-based exercise. I love for individuals, with neuromuscular diagnoses, anybody that has some weakness, when you go into the water, you minimize some of the effects of gravity and you can move in different planes and work in different planes that you aren't able to within the scope of, um, a full fledged gravity environment. And you'll see that I have water-based exercise on both the aerobic slide, as well as the strengthening. You can do resistive based exercises in the pool. Um, and one thing we were talking about a little bit earlier is it can be hard to find a pool. So that's something to look into your local communities and so forth. Um, once again, recommendations, you'll notice all of these recommendations are really in that moderate range. And that's, that's a good place to focus. 
Uh, again, that handout has really good resources uh, of how to highlight what is moderate. And they talk about different scales you can use, different things. The overarching thing that we say is you can talk, you can say a couple sentences, but you cannot sing. Uh, and then frequency, this comes off just recommendations for um, everybody outside of neuromuscular disorders is 30 minutes, five days a week. That's a lot. <laughs> that can be a lot to get, and that can feel overwhelming. And we'll talk a little bit earlier about the, or later, about the idea of starting slow and working your way up. Um, and what I would say is don't let something like that be uh, discouraging. I look at 30 minutes, five days a week, and it can be discouraging, right? So starting somewhere, something is always better than nothing. So next we're gonna go into uh, resistive or strengthening based exercises. Uh, so that's any exercise that's designed and focused on increasing muscle strength, right? Um, you can do this in a lot of ways, just solely body weight, right? Things like squats when you're not holding an additional weight, that's just body weight training. Um, things like push-ups are all body weight. I'm not saying do squats or push-ups, but those are examples of it. Um, you can use weights. It can be free weights. It can be machine-based weights, um, elastic bands. Every PT has a role of elastic bands. Um, those all provide some resistance greater than say gravity, right? And then even if you have a muscle that is weak, gravity can actually be a resistance-based exercise, right? If you can't lift your arm fully against gravity, then you're actually having an external resistance as well. And if, if you can't move a muscle fully against gravity, I recommend moving it to what we call a gravity limited plane, right? So if gravity is pulling you down, you'd wanna put your, so my elbow, when it comes up this way, that's against gravity. If I bring my arm up this way, it's actually working in what we call a gravity eliminated plane, right? And you can do strength and best exercises in those planes. Um, intensity, once again, moderate. Uh, and, and a way to think about that is kind of eight to 12 repetitions until you'd be like unable to complete or you'd feel fatigued, right? Um, and about two times a week is the recommendation. And then the next slide's going to be a little bit about what we don't often think about when we think about exercise. Uh, but because I'm a PT, uh, and I think it was also highlighted really well in that handout I discussed earlier is balance, right? And balance training. And the thing about when we think about balancing what we want to do, really that is focused on improving mobility and decreasing falls, right? And there's a lot of things we can use to do that. We can do balance training. We can bring in um, assistive equipment and all those type of things, all focused on towards improving your mobility and decreasing those falls. And one thing I really always like to highlight when we're talking about balance is that balance is kind of a multifaceted system, right? There's a lot of things that go into keeping you upright and keeping you stable. And really to a very oversimplified version of it is we have a sensory system, right? We have vision, we have our inner ear, which kind of tells us where our head is in space. We have sensation and all that information is fed back into our brain to say, this is your environment. This is where it is in space, right? And then your brain processes all of that. And then it sends signals out to the rest of your body, which I like to call factors, which are just really muscles to say, this is how you need to make these corrections to stay upright, right? So it feeds in all that information. It says, you need to make these corrections. You need to step quickly to the right to stay upright and not lose your balance and fall. And if we have impairment to either one or both of these systems, this is when we can see balance become compromised, right? And so an example of this on the muscle side is that if you like kind of stumble over something and your brain tells your body, okay, you gotta step out, but you don't have the strength in your quads to actually make that step fast enough, then you're gonna fall, right? Your brain processed everything correctly. It told your body to do it. It just, you didn't have the strength in your legs to do it. Um, and so then just a little bit I wanted to highlight from there is when we see a PT and we work on balance, what is the lens we're looking at that through? And really the way I like to think about it is the idea of compensation versus recovery. And so, and what that really talks about is what, you know, we, we, can, un, we can identify like the underlying impairments and how are we gonna focus our rehab care? And one way I always kind of like to describe this is the brain. If you think about if you have shoulder pain, right? And you know, going here hurts. 
your brain very quickly starts going, don't, don't go there. That hurts work in this area. Right. And you're good and you're fine. And you operate and you figure out a few funky compensations and you get it done. For some reason, the brain is not very good at making that transition when it comes to our walking and our balance. If we have a change to our system that puts us at a higher fall risk, you just keep, oftentimes our brain just keeps trying to do things the same way over and over and over again. And then we keep falling. And so physical therapy and balance training can really focus in on trying to help teach the brain ways to make those changes. And so that's often the lens I like to think about this compensation side, right? If we have weakness that's causing us to fall, like weakness in our quad, that we're not expected to necessarily be able to gain back 100% strength, your physical therapist is going to start teaching compensations that you can do to help maintain your balance, right? Take more time around turns, you know, try this, try that. So even if your quad strength stays the same, but you do things slightly differently, you're still maintaining your balance and you're not falling. And that's the goal, right? Something that would be geared towards more towards recovery would be you're weak in your quad. Let's give you a bunch of quad sets. Let's straighten that quad. Cause that's gonna improve your balance. And then what I would say with that is the approach is dependent on the diagnosis on the person, what the underlying impairment is. Uh, oftentimes in neuromuscular and myotonic dystrophy, we're a little heavier on the compensation side than the recovery side. It doesn't mean it's hundred percent one way or the other, but that's kind of the lens that we think about it with. Okay. So I'm going to take a quick drink of water. Okay. So how do we start and keep going when it comes to exercise? And I have to admit, I very much stole this from the handout, um, and from Tina Duong who helped write that handout. Um, and why do we fail? Often it comes down to motivation is one, right? Uh, I think ways that can help with this is making a plan, having like kind of a, a game plan, a plan of action. I'm going to do this X, Y, and Z, and then inviting a friend, right? Friends can help hold you accountable. Uh, oftentimes, you know, we travel for these, con like in my personal life, we travel for these conferences. And if I have someone say, Hey, we're going to get up early and we're going to go outside and we're going to go for a walk or we're going to go for a run. I'm going to do that. Um, for this morning, I didn't have that. And I did not get up early or do any of those things. Right. So having other people hold you accountable is very helpful. Uh, and then the other side is fatigue. Uh, it can be really hard to motivate to exercise if you are already tired. Um, and what I would say to that is find a time of day that works. For example, for myself, I cannot work out after work. Like I cannot get an exercise after work unless it's something really, really fun. But if it's like kind of boring exercise, it's, I'm not going to be successful with that. If I get up early in the morning and I get my exercise done in the morning, I tend to be successful. It's the complete opposite for my husband though. Right. Um, and then just start. And I talked about this a little bit earlier um, with the idea of five minutes, you know, five times a week, 30 minutes a day. That seems like a lot. Um, and that can be daunting. And so some is better than nothing. Work small, right? Start small, build the habit and work your way up. You don't have to go, you know, to not having an exercise program to having the perfect exercise program all in a week. And then the other side is, and this comes from me, is I, I'm a physical therapist and I think it can be confusing, right? Like this is what I do. And when I'm thinking about how do I train for something and how I get better at this or that, it's confusing. And to design a good exercise program, it can be hard. Um, I think fitness apps are coming and they're doing well. A lot of them are starting to have more modifications and so forth. Um, and also a plug for physical therapy, because I'm biased, uh, is that physical therapy can be a great place to help you set up a home exercise program that can then be trans transitioned to home, right? And you can focus on building that, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. Uh, and then just a little bit of a disclaimer, um, if you are going to think about starting a uh, intensive exercise program, it's good to talk with your doctor or your physical therapist about what type of things are safe for you. And then these are just a couple other tips and I've kind of built on them already is start slow, work up, build the habit, right? Small consistency is helpful. Have goals, right? have things you're working towards and then celebrate your success. Like, for example, if I had actually gotten up this morning and gotten a workout, I would have been really obnoxious about it right now. I would have been like high-fiving myself in front of all you guys, right? Like celebrate your success, success and make it fun. And that's really where we're going to go into our next little slide slides and the, where the rest of the talk is going to focus is adaptive sports. And I have to be honest, 
when I'm asked to speak about physical therapy related things, oftentimes I just very quickly try to see how I can work in adaptive sports to it. And so this is what you guys get. We, <laughs> we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this. Um, and fortunately, MDF was off, awesome that they actually um, knew that this is part of what I do and asked, asked me to include this because I was going to do it either way. Um, and so I just want to give a little bit of a fly overview. Um, sorry, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, there are a lot of adaptive sports. And just because what I find the most fun doesn't necessarily mean you will. Um, people have differing likes, interests, opinions, and there's a lot of options out there. Um, you can see that a lot of these are kind of not, they're not team-based sports. You can do them as a community, but they're not necessarily team-based sports. But those are available too. There's wheelchair tennis, there's other modifications, uh, wheelchair basketball, power soccer, and then all kinds of different modifications it doesn't have to be wheelchair based. Uh, and I encourage you as we give this talk and I talk about adaptive sports, I'm going to be talking a lot about what we have in Utah, right? And I'd say that full well knowing that we're not in Utah and a lot of you don't actually live in Utah. And what I hope you take away from this is one, if you ever come to Utah, come visit us because we got some really cool stuff. And two, reach out to your local communities adapt to sports programs, see what's out there, have conversations with them uh, and, and engage and see what you like, right? Because these can be a really great way to start seeing what type of activities you like. So today we're going to highlight a few programs um, that we run through an adaptive sports program called Trails at the University of Utah. And I'll talk a little bit more about Trails later, but I just have to say it now in case I forget uh, this is an incredible program that's been built by a lot of people that weren't me, and we'll talk about them a little bit longer. Um, and they've put in a lot of work to it, and they've developed some really unique equipment. And uh, we will kind of highlight a couple pieces of that equipment as we go through. Just to, and my goal is just to show the diversity of what's out there, right? And show how things are developing. The sports we're going to talk about today are alpine skiing, uh, cycling, some road and mountain and water sports such as kayaking and sailing. <clears throat> so anytime I think about adaptive sports, uh, I think about accessibility and I'm gonna show you guys a lot of videos. Uh, basically the rest of this presentation is gonna turn into videos and photos. This is probably my favorite photo in the entire uh, presentation because this right here sums up the accessibility and the environment we have. That right there on the right is the end of the wheelchair accessible ramp to the water, right? That, that's, that's an accessible waterfront, apparently. And I think so many people in this room have so much more experience with this than I do, is that you go out, you try to engage, and then you face barriers that you weren't even expecting. Um, and so how do we bridge those barriers? And that's often the goal of adaptive equipment, right? Is to bridge that space between the sidewalk to the water. Um, and so what happens is we have limitations to our strength and mobility that can push our independence down, right? It's harder to get around, it's harder to do things. And then we have adaptive equipment that can be a cane, that can be a walker, that can be a ski that we're gonna talk about later. It's all under the same umbrella of trying to increase our mobility and increase our independence. Um, if you notice in this graphic, I didn't get it back to 100%. That's the goal we're always striving for. And sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't though but we're always pushing towards that. And, uh, and I think oftentimes, and I'm speaking to the choir here is we sometimes need to redefine what we mean by independence, right? Like independence doesn't mean alone. It just means that we try to push forward and engage in a way and give equipment that puts as much ownership on the individual as possible. So of course, because I, I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, but this is kind of how it works is okay, so we got this adaptive equipment, it's great, helps increase independence. Then all of a sudden, the second we get the word adaptive, additional barriers happen, right? Um, and you guys are probably really well versed in this. Adaptive equipment can be really expensive, right? And I, in my opinion, it, there can be a decreased level of innovation. It can be very difficult to customize. And not a lot of equipment is designed for those with complex physical limitations or pronounced physical disability. And what we see is those same limitations bleed into adaptive sports. It can be expensive. It doesn't often op optimize independence um, and a low uh, focus on those with complex physical limitations. 
And then whenever we're engaging with something, especially in sports, we have to think about safety. And that's one of the things about when you like go and ask about, go out to your community and interact with adaptive sports is, you know, think about safety, think about the tasks you're engaging in, think about the understanding of the people that are there and participating. Um, because when you're engaging in these activities, there's no other way to say it. There's just, there's a higher risk for injury. Um, and if there's a poor understanding of a diagnosis or of the equipment um, or of the environment, that can even make that risk higher, right? And we don't want an injury to result, re result in a permanent loss of function. <clears throat> so I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, I'm going to present a lot of equipment. All of it is through this program called TRAILS at the University of Utah. Um, TRAIL stands for technology, recreation, access, independence, lifestyle, sports. It used to stand for something else. And then they changed the name on it, changed the acronym for it. And now I can't remember either. So I just have to read it off the slide. <laughs> but what is trail? It's an adaptive sports program. It was started by a doctor named, uh, doc named Jeff Rosenbluth. Um, and he specializes in spinal cord injury. And what he really realizes a lot of the equipment that he that was available in adaptive sports was not well suited for the populations he was working with. And so they've built a lot of working relationships that they've been able to design really innovative equipment by partnering with student in engineering teams at the University of Utah or business teams at the University, um, University of Utah. And we have these student projects and then they come in and it's a prototype and then we refine it and we build really what I think is really cool equipment. And we're gonna highlight some of that equipment here. Um, and kind of making equipment that exists across the gamut. And why I think, uh, and why for me, as we've applied these into neuromuscular and myotonic dystrophy, it works so well, is if you think about spinal cord injury, spinal cord injury is so diverse, right? You can have individuals who's had, who have had a spinal cord injury who walk using a single point cane. You can have individuals who require a power wheelchair. That is a similar story with myotonic dystrophy. If you look around the room and who people are attending, you see individuals walking using a cane or a walker, and you see individuals using a power wheelchair. Um, and so it's been a really good mixing of equipment that really suits well. It doesn't matter about your diagnosis. It's just that physical function. Uh, so this is the current uh, team of trails. That's Jeff. That's the doc that started it. And then Tanya Kari, who's right next to him. She's been there from the beginning and just a driving force. She's actually um, a Paralympic athlete, uh, retired now clearly, but she's a 10-time um, Paralympic gold medalist in cross-country skiing. It was inducted into the Finnish Hall of Fame. And I always have to say that because she doesn't like me too. So. <clears throat> so from there, this is the rest of the trails team and giving them credit that I get to be here to talk, but they really do the heavy lifting. So now we're just going to kind of talk about some fun sports. Uh, we're going to start off with cycling. Uh, we have a cycling and uh, road and mountain bike program. And really what I want to highlight with these photos, if you look at the photo on the right, we have the trailer and we have a bike and there are just a bunch of different types of bikes there, right? There's a whole bunch of options. Um, they're relatively stable. You can see ones that are hand cycles. So powered solely with upper extremity. You can see ones that are powered with lower extremity. Um, this is a photo shoot that they did at the U and I just included it because you can't see it on the slide, but the individual in the back has just like this grunted look on his face. And it's because the individual in front flipped his brake on before the photo shoot. So he didn't realize he was like pedaling with his brake on the whole day. Um, and that's part of the community that develops. It's just a lot of fun. Um, and then from there, we can see some more of the diversity in um, the bikes, right? So we saw those two hand cycles in the photo. Here we can see a cycle that's powered by the individual's feet. Um, the other thing you can see uh, on the photo on the left, you can see his left hand has kind of this black glove around it. That's actually to help with grip, right? So this little sleeve he puts on, wraps around um, and helps him hold on to steer. And then on the also on his left side, you can see that he has an AFO, like that's actually a piece of equipment that can be built into the bike to help support his ankle and works kind of like an AFO. Um, Cause he clearly has some ankle weakness there. And you see that same thing highlighted um, with a different build of bike. That's more of like a mountain bike, but you can still see that same kind of AFO piece of equipment. So there's a lot of options out there, right? And it's about kind of finding the right equipment that works. And this is where DAS sports pro programs can be really helpful because if you're just searching online, you don't know what works, right? Like, I don't know what works for me half the time when I'm searching online. And if you find an adaptive sports program that's got a lot of bikes, you can try a lot of them, right? And you see what works. 
And then the other really fun thing that's coming out that I think is just so great, especially um, in these populations, is the electronic assist. Um, Because if you have some muscle weakness in your hip or your quads, your upper extremity, you know, and you want to go on a longer bike ride and, you know, in Utah, we got a ton of hills and you want to try to make it up those hills, some of that's just not feasible, right? And this electronic assist, I think, is really changing that game. And you still get a really good workout, but then you move at a speed as everybody else, right? You're not slowing everyone down. And that technology is rolling into just commercially available bikes, right? Like all these big brands who just have electronic assist on them, um, which is great because it's actually made the technology more affordable for where it's really cool uses, which is adaptive equipment. Um, so here on the right, you can see that's an, actually an electronic assist hand cycle. So that individual would power through their hands. It has electronic assist motor. You can address the thought throttle. So you can say, I want this much support or I want this much support down. Um, and they all work in different ways. There's a ton of different ways they work. This one is one of those ones that an individual would power with their feet, again, with an electronic assist motor, right? I really love the um, e-assist that's rolling into cycling and other uh, sports. And like I said, the while it makes me mad when I get passed by someone on an e-bike, um, it does make it great because it is making it more affordable when it comes to adaptive equipment. And this is just a photo of um, some of our mountain biking. That, that, that guy's just really good. And then you can see this is one of the bikes we've seen multiple times, once again, on a trail um, kind of throughout. And so it's just, it's about sometimes very simple modifications can make a big difference. And we'll kind of roll from mountain biking into some of the kayaking and sailing we do. And so the next two things we're going to talk about, one's going to be kayaking and sailing, and one's going to be downhill skiing. And I'm going to close both of those kind of topics with what's like the upper echelon of our tech going into adaptive equipment, recognizing that a lot of people in this room don't need that level of assistance, but it's really cool to think about and see that it's out there. So we're just going to kind of show some of the fun bells and whistles that we have. Um, but we have equipment that spans the whole gamut. So what you can see here is this photo on the left, and I'll show this a little closer, but this is a kayak we have. You see that bar holding that up and it just kind of pivots. Uh, and what that does is that unweights the paddle. So if you have some shoulder weakness, right? Like holding that paddle up can be exhausting. Um, that just unweights the paddle. And then if you have a little bit of asymmetry, you're stronger on one side, and you're going this way. So if you're showing your right, you can actually assist with your other arm, right? So it's a really simple piece of equipment. We literally duct tape it into the bottom of the boat. And it's sometimes all individuals need to be a little more independent. Um, here on the right, this is the sailboat we're going to talk about later. And that's a lot of equipment. You can see uh, it's got a joystick on there. It's got a sip and puff. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is a closer look at what I was talking about. Uh, this is our classy version where we didn't duct tape it on the bottom. We actually have a br bracket for it, but you can see how it's holding that paddle up. That's a paddle board um, with seating options. The other thing is you can see all those lateral support and seating options. So if you can't sit, maintain your balance on the paddle board or stand on the paddle board, if that's limiting, there's seating options. And you see that there's lateral support. And the general theme is, is anything that an individual needs seat, seating uh, modifications in their wheelchair, we can match in adaptive equipment, right? Um, and then on the other side, you can see those like little blue things there. Those are uh, kind of outriggers that we put on and it makes the paddle board, we do it on our kayaks too, it makes them much more stable, right? So that limit limits the risk of tipping. If you have some balance permits, that's hard to stay. Putting those uh, kind of outriggers out on there just make things much more stable. Here you can see some of our grip modifications to be able to hold on to the paddle. Um, Cause sometimes that's all individuals need is they just can't, it's just, they just can't form the grip for the paddle. Um, you can see that there's one that like goes around the wrist and then you actually just slide it in. Like it has a little knob, right? And just slide it into that little thing and you kind of hold it through your wrist. You can see that there's also just some levers that can help kind of approximate your fingers to that, that paddle as well. So. What, again, what I wanna highlight here is these are all relatively low tech modifications, um, which can be quite impactful. Here we're gonna talk about a little bit of a higher tech modification. Uh, so this got around a little bit um, for individuals that use wheelchairs or power mobility. 
um, and trying to get them transferred into kayaks and boats in the water, right? Like we'd have our kayaks pulled up um, just kind of along that dirt. And that is a really hard, difficult, hot place to do a transfer. And so we had a student team start working on this project. So that funky looking boat folds out into a dock with a wheelchair accessible ramp. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. I'll show you a little bit of the, um, a better view of it. You can see the wheelchair accessible ramp. You can also see a sailboat. We have some of our uh, kayaks there, and then you can see that jet ski. I just like to put that in there because um, that's our rescue uh, boat. Whenever you need anyone in the water, you got to think about safety, but also really we're the first program to get them to buy a jet ski with the University of Utah funds under the umbrella of safety. So we're pretty proud of that one. Um, so if we look now, this is just a video of an individual that has actually drives this chair with a sip and puff system. Uh, you can see that he's able to drive right onto this dock. Uh, and then as we get in there, that's a really great environment uh, to be doing a transfer and getting set up in a boat, um, getting everything we need situated before we launch. And here it's an individual using a power wheelchair. But if you think about it, if you have some weakness in your legs, your quads, trying to transfer and get situated in a boat that's you know, sitting on the ground that's, you know, mid calf level in mud, that's a barrier and that's a challenge. And this is another great area that you could do that in there and you can launch right from the boat on a stable, cool surface and get everything going. So even though it's, you know, designed for the use of a power wheelchair, it doesn't even mean you need a wheelchair to make use of it. Um, here you can see a sailboat in the back. Uh, that's a really good view that will actually, that whole ramp lowers down and that's how we launch that sailboat from out of there. Uh, so again, you can see the sailboat in the back there that we're going to talk about here. This is a paddleboard sitting on top of a kayak. I don't know why that it's sitting on top of a kayak. It's just, it's a good photo of, um, other equipment we have on the dock. So that's why it's there. Um, but you can see that that's sitting on these two prongs, right? We pull a pin and that whole system will rotate into the inside of the dock. And so this is giving you the side that like, if it's hard for you to get down onto the ground, trying to get into a kayak that's mid shin level it's, it's just hard. And so if we can bring that in, that whole system will actually go up and down as well. So you could come onto that dock, get situated, sit on the kayak where get, you know, where it's a good transfer height for you, get everything set up. And then we rotate the whole system out. It lowers down into the water, you launch off. And then we do done, you come back, the prongs are in the water, you pull the kayak up, it raises you out, turns you back in. Right. Um, so once again, like the uses have just been really, really helpful. So now we're going to talk about that kayak I, or that sailboat I keep alluding to. Like I said, this is kind of the upper end of modifications that we have. This sailboat, the thing that is so unique about it is it can be independently controlled with either wheelchair joystick controls or a sip and puff drive system. So an individual with no upper extremity function can drive this sailboat independently from the time we launch it out of the dock. It has a little electric motor to drive in and out of the dock. All of that's controlled through those systems. Uh, I, I'm assuming there's some sailors in here and I'm gonna, I don't, I can't remember the term. Uh, it's not for the, it, to take the sail in and out. That, that's all controlled through the same thing. Um, every turn and movement of that sailboat is controlled through the sip and puff or the wheelchair drive, sticks, wheelchair drive system. So here we have a video of the sailboat on a pretty beautiful day out on the lake, um, some pretty good wind. You can have family on the boat. Uh, and you can see that this individual is actually on a ventilator. He has no upper extremity function of his hands whatsoever. And every single turn, every single movement of that boat is coming from him via that sip and puff drive. Uh, the only problem with this video is he's a Miami Dolphins fan. And uh, my husband's a Buffalo Bills fan, so that, that don't go well. Uh, so what was that? He's very happy today. He's made multiple Buffalo Bills paraphernalia purchases so far today. Um, so now we're going to transition into downhill skiing. So what I'm going to try, try to highlight here, same way I did a little bit with the kayaking sailing is the diversity of equipment that we have, right? So the photo on the left, uh, is a mono ski. It's one single ski underneath. Um, individuals that have some like lower leg weakness, some core weakness, um, quad weakness can do really well in this ski, right? Um, and 
you kind of ski with these outriggers here. This is my friend Wally, who's a really good rip and mono skier. Um, he has a paraplegic injury and he's making the same turns. It's just, it's, it's a different form of skiing, right? Like it's just a different piece of equipment. Um, that was a really fun day out on the mountain, but however, that equipment may not be right for everybody. Right. Um, and so then we have more options. So here on the right hand is a bi ski. So that's a step, step up in support from say the mono ski. It can also be used as like a learning tool. Um, cause that mono ski to ski like Wally, you gotta put in a lot of hours. <laughs> that's, you know, in any, any way to get good in activity, you gotta put in a lot of hours. Um, that bi ski can be a really good, you can see that has two skis on the bottom. It's a little more stable. It's a really good learning tool or is just a great, a great tool for some individuals that need a little more support than say that mono ski here. You can see, this is actually, you can hook skis to the bottom. And this is actually a walker. Um, that people can use to help ski for either alpine skiing or downhill skiing um, if they just need a little bit more of support on their legs, but the sit skis aren't necessarily appropriate. Um, I think I find a lot of indi individuals end up opting for the sit skis just because they're a little bit like sleeker and, and allow for a lot of independence. Um, and from there, maybe we need more support, right? So maybe uh, you're a full-time power wheelchair user, uh, but you have a lot of strength in your upper extremities. There's this ski here that has two skis on the bottom and the individual skis it with outriggers articulating back and forth. You can see him kind of throwing his hands there. Um, this is my friend, Andy. He's a very good skier. Here, the change that you can see is the tether behind him. Um, and you will we'll kind of see there's a theme as we talk about the next little bit of sports uh, of the skis is that that ski is a little bit wider in the base, right? So it doesn't tip easy. That mono ski can tip pretty easy. You gotta be pretty balanced. That ski is wider. The two skis are set more kind of offset. Actually, here's a good photo of it. You can see how much wider those, that base is. So that ski, when you're going downhill, it doesn't tip. And anybody who's tried to learn anything knows that if you're dealing with gravity, one of the fastest ways to slow down, even though it's a little painful, is to tip over right? And so we need to have somebody on the back that if we need an all in case of emergency to break and scrub speed, you got to have an e-brake, right? Um, and that's just because we don't really have that bandwidth to be like, oh, well, I'm just going to like slide out a little bit. So that's what the tether comes in. And we'll see that again. This is once again, heading into the sailboat, the sailboat that we talked about that was, you know, controlled with wheelchair joystick controls. This is again, kind of our upper end technology is that this ski can be controlled with wheelchair joystick controls or a sip and puff drive system. Um, what you see here is you see on the right hand side of the screen, you actually see actuators, right? And those articulate the skis to the surface. And we've designed a program that can drive and facilitate those turns um, via the ski. And so here you'll see an individual um, skiing. And once again, we see the tether, but every turn that that individual is making is coming from them. Can anybody guess who, how old this individual is? He's four. Yeah, he's four. Um, and he normally would ski, uh, in a front loader backpack. His family's big skiers. He's skiing a front loader backpack, um, with his dad and his dad would take him around the mountain. He was kind of getting too big for that. Uh, and so we put him in this and he just took off. Like you could tell he'd been skiing since, since he was, you know, two with his dad. He knew how to read the mountain and he just took off and he's just a quiet little kid. But the only thing he said all day long was the word jump. Um, but he just crushed it. The, and I'll, I'll point out a few of these pieces of technology here. Um, what you can see is you, once again, you see the tether, we talked about why that's important, but if you notice that instructor has his hand down by his side and we have this technology in the sailboat too, but it's really impactful on the ski is that's actually remote control. And that can actually override the ski if needed. That was designed for safety. Um, if a medical complication or anything happens on the ski hill that we need to get down fast, the instructor can actually take over the ski and ski it down. One of our requirements is actually that. Uh, you have to be able to ski it down to be the tether. You have to be able to ski it down via the remote without anyone in it. And it is really fun to like see people look at this, like ski go by with no one in it, not really know what's going on. Um, but really the thing that it's developed that we use it for is it's actually a teaching tool, right? If you think about when you're learning to do an act, 
uh, task. And especially when you're learning to ski, if you're with an instructor, they're kind of like there and they're interacting with you and they're showing you how to shift your weight and do all this. And when the tether's behind you, you somewhat can lose that interaction. And so I don't care what equipment you're using to learn to ski. Everybody has a turn that's more um, instinctual than the other, right? Some, everybody has like, oh, I can turn right really well, but I can't turn left. It's the same thing in this piece of equipment. So a good example of this is someone's like sk- struggling with a left-hand turn. The instructor can actually take the ski, show them how the turn should feel, and then get off the remote and give it back to them and let them start negotiating that. Uh, and then this is just another video and why I, I just put it in here. Cause I love it. Um, one of the things I really love about this video is everybody, the majority of people behind him are actually his family skiing with him. And he was pretty scared to go. And so he forced, he insisted that his dad went with him and his dad hasn't skied in like 15 years or snowboard in 15 years. And what you'll see is his dad did not survive the day quite as well as what, um, as what he did. And I, being the sympathetic human that I am, have put this in a slideshow and both this child and I will never let him, his dad, forget it. Um, so that's kind of the end of the equipment uh, rundown, fly overview. Um, what I wanted to highlight is I've talked a lot about a program that's based in Utah, right? And I, I say that full well, recognizing that we're in California. As I said, If you ever come out to see us, please come see us. Um, The other thing is, is that's something we recognize. And we started partnering partnering with adaptive sports across the country to get some of this higher end equipment out there um, through a program called Tetra Adapt, which is just a nonprofit spinoff of trails, which allows us to loan out the equipment. So what we do is we have a fleet of skis and we have a fleet of boats that we actually loan out to programs um, for the season and then bring them back, do any modifications we need, and then they can go back out. So this is an incomplete list of where the skis are and where the boats are. You can see that the boats are lagging. It's a lot harder to ship a, you can't really ship a sailboat in the mail. The ski packs up into a somewhat large box, but um, we launch the skis first and then the boats are slowly coming. Uh, And so then this slide is kind of for your information. this is a QR code. It'll take you to the Tetra Adapt website, which that's kind of the spinoff of trails um, that we're posting kind of things that are going on. Um, if you scroll to the bottom, you'll see this sign up to stay informed. Uh, that's like a once a month newsletter. I've never gotten, I'm signed up for it. I've never gotten any spam from it. I love it. I just get an update of what's going on. Um, and so I recommend signing up for that. It's a good way to like keep it in your head of like, oh, hey, these things are available. Oh, they're here or there. And then the next one is once again, for your information, this is the trails website and they're actually linked. So if you have access to one, you can click and see the other. This is the QR code to get it. And again, if you scroll to the bottom, you'll see a sign up to stay informed. Uh, And that's just a once a month newsletter. They'll be like, hey, we're scheduling for sailing. Hey, we're scheduling for skiing. This is what's going on. We have this uh, community outreach, yada, yada, yada. Um, I think it's a great way to make all our world feel a little bit smaller. Uh, and then down at the bottom trails grew up and got social media, uh, and I don't have social media, so I keep getting in trouble for not being a follower, but I feel if I can recruit a bunch of people, then I can claim all you. So if you guys have Instagram join and then give me credit. And then I just like to close, uh, with this slide. This is just a gratuitous shot of all our fun equipment out on the lake um, on a beautiful day with the drone that Dr. Rosenbluth bought for his kids. Uh, And it's just, it's a fun program. It's a fun place to be. Like I said, please come out and see us. And then I'd really like to close with a thank you to the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation for giving me the opportunity to talk and share about this equipment and what we love to do and be here to answer any of your questions. I think it really speaks to what programs like this do to bring us all closer together, right? We're all spread all over the world or in country, but us all coming together and being able to be see each other in person is incredibly valuable. And so thank you to my Tonic Dystrophy Foundation for letting us do that. And I'll take any questions. I have no idea how we are on time. Yeah, we have about 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, okay. 
I love kayaking, mm-hmm. but I can't get off the ground. Yeah. Like if I'm sitting down, how, and we have like, we have a Makokota river in Iowa where they'll supply the kayak. Um, and then you have a very small area where they'll just hold the boat for you while you get out. Mm-hmm. That won't work for me. What kind of adaptive equipment would they have that would help me stand up? Help you stand up. Um, I, that's a good one. Uh, I think there's in what, like, depending on the routes that you take, right. Um, there are adaptive docks coming in that, that can be helpful with that. Um, and if you have say like, cause where you get out, right. I'm assuming you get out at like another boat dock. Um, yeah, maybe like the potential to have like a ramp or something added onto the dock that you can actually kind of pull the kayak up on. Right. And then what you would do is you would stabilize that kayak and then, uh, kind of towards the edge and you could rotate out and have a like elevated surface. I'm not doing a very good job of explaining this, but if you can somehow get one, like get a dock that you can access that's safe and stable, right. And get a kayak like propped up on an elevated surface using a ramp or something like that, that's going to put you at a higher surface. And then you could swing your legs out and then stand up from there. Um, the other option would be, uh, while not ideal, but if you don't have that set up, um, the other option would be if you're with somebody, um, even having like a, just a sling that people use for like Hoyers or something like that. Um, not that you need a Hoyer lift, but having a sling that you can put under you and then just have a couple people help with that lift, um, getting you from that lower position up to a higher position and having like a bench next to it. So you don't have to go, it just be a lift from the kayak to like a chair height. Right. And then you would sit on that, you get situated and you could stand from there. Does that make sense? Um, and so not the perfect solution, but potentially one. And then I would say practice it at home, right? Like, like the slings you can buy for relatively cheap one to two people could help with that lift. Um, but practice it at home, not in the water first. Uh, But I would say like a lift from there to like a chair height surface or the lowest surface you could get up from on your own. Yeah. Yeah. That that's, I think that like, there's a lot of things we can do, but I think that's where I would start. And you could even consider like going to a physical therapist and stating, this is my goal. And I would like help figuring out these transfers from going to the ground to standing up. Um, and they could help you with that. And there's other technologies, like it's, it's ridiculous how expensive there are. There are like these inflatable, um, their first like safe use at home. Right. But they're like a cushion that you can push a bunch of, you use like a pump to put a bunch of air to into, and they elevate. So if you have that, it's flat. If it's battery operated, you like turn that on and then that would elevate you up. That'd be another way to do it. But they're also ridiculously expensive for what they are. They're like thousands of dollars. So, um, that's where I would start. And I do think like even going to a physical therapist and saying, this is my goal. This is the transfer I want to be able to do. Um, and I have this support to do it. I have this individual to help me. Can you train the two of us to work through this and how do we do it safely? Um, do you guys, um, we're, we're from uh, Surfside beach in mm-hmm. South Carolina mm-hmm. and the, it's just a very small town between Myrtle beach and Charleston. Uh, they, they're an autism friendly, mm-hmm. um, beach or city. Awesome. Is there, and I, you know, with your adaptive, um, equipment, do you, is there any city, like, I, I don't know if there's anybody myotonic like representative in here, but is there like a city that would do, or has anybody thought of doing that? Like a, I mean, a myotonic dystrophy friendly city that would have equipment for people or activities or. I don't know. That's just what I thought of. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that idea. And I, I think there's also the side and whenever we talk about best ways to kind of get like equipment out and so forth, I think partnering with an organization, right. Um, and whether it be an adaptive sports program or an organization that knows the diagnosis can be the way to help distribute that equipment. Cause you know, our goal is to get it to individuals, um, 
and in, in groups that are going to use it. Right. And like when we first sent out the skis, it just, our view is just get somebody out. You want, you wouldn't have gotten out otherwise. And some uh, organizations really rose to that occasion and some just didn't have the bandwidth too. Uh, and so I, I think that's really the way that we start bridging those gaps. And if, if anyone identifies anyone or like that, reach out to us. Um, we can set up calls. If you're ever in Utah, we show you the equipment if they want to come out and meet people. Cause I really think that's the way for us to kind of, uh, make the world a little smaller. Back yeah. there. And then we have one in the middle eventually. Okay. Yeah. I've got a, uh, statement and I guess two questions. One of them is, um, well, the statement, it's the city of Long Beach up the coast a little bit. Uh, they have an adaptive rowing program. Nice. Uh, but however, I think they have to have, uh, volunteers to help them get into, into that. So related to that question is, uh, there's those swimming pool cranes. Would that work? I mean, if you've got a floating dock, stable enough. Might that work to get them into uh, at least a narrow? Book? Yeah. I mean, that's, I haven't thought about that. I don't have experience with that, but I certainly think that is a feasible, um, approach. Right. And that, and kind of what we were talking about too. I mean, that would take city making or the program or city making modifications to make these things more accessible. But even those lifts to help get people in and out of the pools, um, I think that's a very good point and could be something helpful for you too. Once again, bigger lifts than uh, like bigger institutional lift than other resources um, and exactly how that would be done. Um, I can't say I have experience with that, but I, I could see it working. Yeah. Right. Okay. And uh, the other one is kind of related to your, uh, the, your, your statement, your question. It's uh, on your website. Do you have uh, locations where those boats are loaned? Uh, so we have, as I said, it, it was an incomplete list a little bit. I can go back. Um, this is an incomplete list. And I say that because actually giving a talk one time and someone talked and they were like, oh, we have this ski. And I was like, I, it's not on my list. I didn't know that. Um, so it's kind of constantly changing. So I'd say the best way to find out the most current list, I try to keep it fairly current, um, but is to just email us um, at the trails website. There's a contact us and that just goes directly to us. And you just say, hey, I'm really interested in where X is. Could you give me more information? And they respond really quickly. Yeah, make sure that you're still there if it's not out of season. Yeah, it's yeah, it's tailing off. But yeah, absolutely. Then I think we had one in the center there. Is there a way to find like physical therapists that work with people with myotonic dystrophy or that know about it already? There is, I don't, and if, if I'm, if I'm wrong in this, I haven't been exposed to like a exact network that does it. Um, I think some of that comes down to, depending on where you're located, a lot of the like physical therapists that work, if you have like a multidisciplinary clinic, um, the physical therapists that you see there, if they don't do treatment themselves, they often know someone. The other thing that we utilize a lot in Utah that I, I encourage, um, because you know, as we go more rural, it's hard to find clinics that are appropriate is I like to think of physical therapy as if you have a physical therapist who is interested and open to learning, um, and is a good clinician and innovative of the way they approach things, their knowledge of myotonic dystrophy, it, it's not that it's unnecessary, but if they're open to learning, they'll look up things, they'll do these things. And then the other thing I always really encourage is if that physical therapist has any questions, I give them my contact info all the time. And we'll have a good long conversation about exercise and myotonic dystrophy and that. And I find that I can provide that education to a physical therapist who's actually probably much more experienced than I am in the actual clinical care, like in actually designing a program and doing those things, because I don't do that as frequently. Um, so if you're unable to identify one, but you do have, uh, like one that you see multidisciplinary clinic or one you've worked with in the past, I think facilitating that conversation between the two of them is helpful. If that's not an option, um, making sure you end up with somebody that you're like, okay, you know, my, you know, so-and-so has my atonic dystrophy, uh, myself or my child. And have you ever worked with that? If not, is there a way I can loop you in with resources? Are you willing to kind of take that on? Um, and, and it's pretty, 
easy to tell those that do and those that don't. Right. Um, so I don't have a great answer for you with that. Um, I think when you go to someone that doesn't have experience, um, if they're open to learning and, uh, some conversations, then we can very quickly bridge that gap with some communication. We have time for maybe one more, maybe two more questions. Okay, uh, microphone real quick. You guys have been so much better than any of us in like other sessions of using the microphone. We never do, you guys have been perfect. Um, the adaptive bicycle mm -hmm. um, that, you, you know, that has the two front wheels. I mean, that's a pretty expensive bike. Yeah. And are there any, are there, is there any way to get funding for adaptive equipment? Yeah, there actually is. Um, and I know of one to two, uh, trails actually helps a lot of individuals apply for grants and, uh, and, and fund purchasing of their equipment. Uh, a really good one is called that challenge athletes foundation. Uh, they're called calf grants and cat like challenge athletes foundation is, and then they shorten it to CAS. So calf grants, um, and they do a really good job of, uh, looking at like the equipment you're looking for and helping financially with, uh, with that. So there are, and that's the one I know of, that's the one we've utilized a lot, but there are institutions that do help do that. The challenge. Athletes Foundation. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Melissa. This is excellent.